citizens of, govern of the governors of Texas and Arizona uh, who have bused hundreds of people uh, to D.C. each week since April. I am joined by members of my administration, as well as Council Member Brianna Doe, uh, who chairs the Committee on Human Services. Uh, we are also joined by community-based organizations who continue to play uh, critical roles in our response. I'm going to um, provide some background information so we understand the context of where we are today uh, and how we move forward. We uh, know uh, that migrants uh, coming to and through D.C. are uh, arriving from a range of nations. Their experience in the United States begins when they surrender to federal immigration officials at the southern border. We understand uh, that once they are cleared through a federal immigration process, they are then released on humanitarian parole with a date to appear in immigration court. So after being released to community organizations, some migrants are have been offered a ride to D.C. paid for by the state of Texas and state of Arizona. Some people are taking this ride to get to their destinations along the way um, because it gets them closer to their final destination. And some um, because they have nowhere else to go. And quite frankly, I believe that some are being tricked or lied to. Our experience is that the vast majority of people uh, move onward to destinations outside of D.C. We know from media reports, and I stress this, uh, that these are numbers we can't uh, exactly verify, but the governors of Texas and Arizona report that they have sent upwards of 9,400 people on buses destined uh, for the District of Columbia. Uh, and we know uh, that they are targeting Washington, D.C., not because of any particular ties that the people boarding the buses have to Washington, D.C., uh, but they want to make a point to the federal government. So here you can see a timeline of what I have discussed uh, since April, starting with the announcement back in April, the various discussions that we have had along the way or attempted to have uh, with those states, uh, as well as with the federal government, uh, including uh, our coordination with the federal government uh, to identify a community-based organization, SAMU in our case, uh, and the United Way, uh, who has helped facilitate uh, the federal grant, the FEMA Emergency Food and Shelter Program grant, which I believe now is up to uh, almost $2 million to help uh, with this effort. Uh, and we are also grateful to the other community-based organizations who have participated uh, in this aid, including Catholic Charities and Caresin. As I, uh, as you've heard me say a number of times, that we, regardless of the federal response, which I think has been lacking in some respects, that the District of Columbia would continue to work uh, with our partners to advance what we need uh, and to make sure that our systems in DC are not broken um, by a crisis that is certainly not of our making. And we are putting in place a framework that will allow us uh, to have a coordinated response with all of our partners. So uh, this response will include a program to meet all buses, uh, and given that most people will move on, our primary focus is to making sure that we have a humane uh, and, and efficient welcome process that will allow people to move on to their final destinations. That process will include us understanding the needs of the people arriving, their basic needs, uh, 
when they arrive in the district. We will also set up a system that is distinct from our homeless services system that is tailored to the needs of migrants and ensures our response to this humanitarian crisis is consistent uh, and well coordinated. Uh, we, of course, uh, do everything that is consistent uh, with our values. We are proud of the progress that we've made in our homeless services system uh, that better targets and meets the needs of DC residents experiencing homelessness, and we remain committed to making homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. We are also recognizing that the district's homeless services system is not set up to support the unique needs of migrants coming into DC, nor are our community-based homeless service providers staffed to support the needs of migrants. And we are, and we realize that we need uh, a new system, and that's what we will advance today. Uh, I am creating, establishing a new office within the Department of Human Services uh, called the Office of Migrant Services. This new office will, as I said, be housed in DHS and it will help us tailor our needs um, for migrants to provide reception services, or reps, spit services, meals, transportation, uh, urgent medical needs, transportation to connect um, people to resettlement services and the like. We are allocating an initial $10 million to stand up the new office and support organizations working in the field. We will seek reimbursement from FEMA for all eligible uh, services. Uh, and we have experience working with FEMA on the reimbursement of eligible services. And I'll say a little bit more about what uh, we think FEMA could do uh, to make sure that states and cities like ours aren't left holding the bag. And so in order to create uh, this new offices, I am declaring a public emergency. Uh, and this public emergency will give my administration the following authority. Uh, to establish a migrant services office with DHS and direct the department to provide services and supports to migrants arriving from the southern border states, authorize the city administrator and the chief financial officer to set aside and spend funds uh, to respond to the emergency, to authorize the chief procurement officer uh, to respond to the emergency, and uh, directs the city administrator and the department to establish new programs that expand or modify existing programs in response to the emergency. I will also be sending emergency legislation to the council that codifies the new migrant services provisions. Uh, so we look forward to beginning uh, this next chapter in our response. Uh, we recognize that we don't know and we have no control on all that is coming towards the district. Um, but we do uh, have control on how we make sure that our values are present in all that we do. And the hard work that we have done uh, to build our system of human services for DC residents uh, is not broken. Uh, so with that, I want to acknowledge Council Member uh, Nadeau and we can take a few questions. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I want to also acknowledge the many partners who've been involved um, since the beginning. Um, Karesen, Catholic Charities, SAMU, our mutual aid groups, so many of our faith entities, uh, our faith organ faith-based organizations, churches, synagogues, and volunteers across the city doing what we always do here in the District of Columbia, which is welcome folks um, and help serve them. Um, I see today we have many of those groups represented as well as other longtime advocates in our Latino community. Um, so it's wonderful to see you all today. So it's been said, but it's worth reiterating that the governors of Texas and Arizona have created this crisis. And the federal government has not stepped up to assist the District of Columbia. So we, um, along with our regional partners, will do what we've always done. We'll rise to the occasion. And I'm so thrilled to see the mayor's emergency today um, and look forward to working with her 
on getting the emergency legislation passed through the council as well. In July, um, I worked with uh, colleagues on the council in drafting a letter to the mayor asking um, for five things, funding for emergency services, dedicated district staff to re respond to the migrants arriving, um, demands of dignified arrivals from Texas and Arizona, and respite space, as well as access to COVID testing and isolation. And today the mayor um, has finished responding by taking action. Um, this will allow the executive to answer every demand in our letter. And my hope is that all the members who joined me on that letter will also join in this effort today. Um, we know Mayor Bowser is already providing testing and isolation. They've already stepped up to demand dignified arrivals. Um, and this allows our government to do all it can to fund emergency services, dedicated staff, and pursue a respite sp space. Um, I've also been working regionally in uh, my role as chair of a committee at the Metro Washington Council of Governments. We were able to pass unanimously a resolution for regional cooperation through our, our departments of human services and through our emergency management systems. Um, I'm proud that that resolution has been adopted by the full Council of Governments for the region, which is our 25 closest in jurisdictions in the DMV, and that we will be discussing it further this Friday at the Human Services Committee of the COG as well, because undoubtedly um, this requires a regional response to be complete. We know, as the mayor said, that the majority of those arriving are just passing through. And for those who do stay, we will do what we always do. We will welcome them into our community. Um, but at the same time, by creating this system, by creating these new programs, we'll be able to adequately serve them and their needs. Our systems right now are just not set up to serve them in the way that they need to assist them in getting to their final destination. Um, we've learned from border towns like El Paso and Brownsville. Um, and in many ways, the governors of Texas and Arizona have turned us into a border town. We don't know how long this will take to resolve. We don't know how long they will continue busing. And so the right thing to do here is to be prepared to ensure we can greet every bus. We can get people off on the right foot. We can get them where they want to go. And that will ultimately help them in their immigration process. So um, I'll leave it there, um, and I thank you, Mayor Bowser, thank you. for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Okay. Yes, if you could just introduce yourself. Yes, Leonard Fleming, DC News Now. Mayor, how did you come up with the $10 million figure? And we talked about FEMA reimbursing you. What is the process for that, and are you certain that FEMA will reimburse you? Um, we are certain that these are qualifying expenses. Uh, the initial tranche, which we will uh, take from our con contingency cash, uh, really represents how much we think it will get started to have a contract staff, uh, which remains one of, one of the biggest issues that we need. We need people um, to to make sure that we have coverage throughout the day. So the largest part of, of that number is an estimate on what it will take to get a contractor on board. Any other questions? Yes. Mayor Bowser, why have you not come out more forceful against the Biden administration on what's happening? Um, I, I've said frequently what we need from the federal government. Uh, I've said frequently how disappointed I am um, that our first need uh, for more people on the ground uh, that helps to respond for, to a humanitarian crisis quickly. Uh, we have called on the National Guard and been uh, granted the National Guard a few dozen times since I've been mayor, so I'm very disappointed in that. And also, I'm very disappointed in not having a federal site um, that we can use. So is he partly to blame here, then? Is the federal government... The president. Yes. The president, the White House, and anybody else who was involved in the National Guard not being granted for the district's humanitarian response. Yes. We're going along with that, what com where are those conversations with the federal government at this point? Uh, they're ongoing. And, uh, anybody else who has asked the question? Yes. Uh, 
Hi. Can you just uh, introduce yourself, please? Yeah, absolutely. Amanda Michelle Gomez, WAMU DCist. Families are currently, migrant families are currently staying at two hotels, the Days Inn and Hampton Inn. Do you anticipate moving? It sounds like this office is going to be providing temporary accommodations. Or are you going to move, continue to move more families in there? Or are, I know the Hampton Inn is a COVID hotel. It's used for COVID quarantine. So are families going to be moved out of there and into Days Inn only? What are, what are the housing services provided? Uh, right now, uh, we consider that a temporary housing service that we're providing at the Days Inn. And it is in line uh, with what the Migrant Services Office will do, um, provide temporary housing uh, while people are, are moving on to their next de destinations. Are the families at Hampton going to be, which is a quarantine hotel, going to be moved to Days Inn soon? I don't know that that's our plan. Okay. And then a second question. Uh, students are being enrolled, my right? students are being enrolled in DCPS. Um, are there going to be more ESL teachers at those schools that most are going to, or what other supports are those students going to receive once at school? Uh, our students, regardless of whether they are coming from the Days Inn or they're coming from any other location in the district, will be served in our schools, and they will be served adequately. Yes, Mark. Uh, I got several questions, Mayor Bass. Okay. Can you tell us the number of students who are currently enrolled from the uh, asylum seeking? We think we have about 70. And then can you tell me how many people are currently being housed either in uh, the shelters or in the hotels right now? Um, let me get you a, a specific number, Mark. We can't tell you how many are in the hotels. I'll get that number for you. And then you mentioned in one of your slides having a presence at Union Station. What's that going to look like? Is that 24-7? Are you going to have a, a welcome center or some kind of processing center stand up at Union Station? Oh, we don't currently um, have a space at Union Station. I think you know that we don't control Union Station. Uh, and we continue to uh, work on having the appropriate space for our staff, contract staff, and potentially the processing of people um, coming from buses at Union Station or close to Union Station. Right, so what, what's that going to look like? Is that going to be something that's going to be, I mean, do you know yet when buses, is that coordination happening between Arizona and Texas that you know when buses leave, ETA on buses arriving, or are you just going to have to stand out there and wait? Uh, we expect to have a 24-7 presence. And then what about a, a center? Are you looking to stand up a center that one would both work kind of like Virginia Williams in the sense of the processing center for people as well as a place for people that I know you had, had asked for the national for the armory for something like this. Are you looking for some kind of facility or building a facility like that where people could actually sleep and be processed or one or the other? Um, we right now uh, have an example in the region uh, where people um, after you kind of having initial you know, discussion, a processing, a triage, if you will, is are have a, are staying up to seventy two hours until they make other arrangements. Uh, we think that that is a process that works well to deal with the immediate needs of arriving um, folks from Texas and Arizona. Uh, we don't we don't uh, have a likely space in the district. Um, we continue um, with partner organizations to look for that type of space. Inside or outside of the district? All. Is that breaking news that we're interested in? What's that? What, the director's island just. 94 families, 348 people at the, at a, a staying at DC hotels. At hotels, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so you mentioned having a contract. Do you know, is that going to SAMU? Do you know what the, who the contractor, you pick the contractor? No, the contractor would not be going, the contract would not be with SAMU. Uh, it would be to support SAMU. I don't understand. Can you clarify that? It would not be with SAMU. It would be to contract personnel that would support SAMU. Okay. And can you explain the difference between a state of emergency and declaring a public emergency? Is there is there something different between there? I mean, we're, from COVID, we're used to you declaring a state of emergency or a health emergency. 
this is a public emergency. Is that you could call it a humanitarian emergency. You could call it a migrant emergency. It's just uh, the semantics, really. What it is uh, is a mayor's order that gives me um, some administrative authority that I don't normally have. Um, and that administrative authority lasts for 15 days. Uh, I will be, when the council returns from recess, submitting uh, a request for them to extend that emergency. Uh, and this will allow us to, um, for example, create uh, this new office of migrant services that also uh, streamlines, because we don't currently have a system of services focused on this population, our migrant population. Uh, and this allows us to streamline those services uh, while at the same time not burdening our homeless services system. Yes. Mayor, uh, Ted Hessen with Reuters. I'd like to ask you, do you have a sense of how many people you're preparing to come? And then when it comes to these hotel rooms for the families, what's the approximate cost for each family? Or is there some kind of uh, metric you can give us to explain how much those hotel rooms are costing? Um, I don't right now, but I'm happy to provide that. And then overall, do you have a sense of who you're expecting or how many you're expecting or preparing to receive? All we know, um, this is what we know, is that the crisis at the border is not lessening, is getting worse. Uh, we're told uh, that with, a, un, with uncertainty in, you know, like the political system, uh, as well as the, just weather, for example, uh, that numbers increase during this time of year. And so we also know the political statements that we've heard from Texas and Arizona. So our expectation is to believe what they've said um, and that hundreds of more buses will be coming over the fall. Yeah, anybody who hasn't asked a question yet? Yes, oh, well, let, me, let me just finish with the press and then I'll come, um, yes. Uh, yes, Mayor Bowser. Yes, Lou. Tomorrow, uh, yep. Washington Blade. And uh, as you may know, uh, Mayor, uh, there's been reports that uh, in various border stations where migrants are coming to the country, problems have surfaced regarding LGBTQ migrants, particularly transgender migrants, in terms of uh, discrimination and mistreatment. There's been reports of that. Uh, uh, would you take steps to ensure that the programs that you're announcing today and the efforts that you're announcing, uh, those who are carrying them out would have a sensitivity and uh, uh, some knowledge on the potential uh, issues impacting LGBTQ migrants. Well, thank you for raising that. And we, anybody that we work with, we expect to uphold our DC values. Uh, and that includes in this space, so absolutely. And okay, I'll go for another round. Let's start with Stephanie. Um, two questions, Mayor Bowser, if I may. Um, you had mentioned the history of not getting the National Guard cooperation that you've requested in the past. You showed us the timeline starting since April. Why, given this humanitarian crisis that you pointed out, was this action not taken sooner? Uh, we think we're actually taking it at the right time, um, where we have uh, responded in a lot of different stages, not knowing um, the full capacity of what we would be dealing with from day to day or month to month. Uh, and so we thought it was very appropriate that we worked uh, with our partner organizations who are very experienced in this work, um, who've done migrant services work, um, to, to work with them. The sheer capacity um, or the sheer, um, not capacity, was the, the, the volume of the work and our expectation that that could increase uh, really necessitates a, a broader coordination from us. And then in, in reverse to that or our previous question, how does taking this action not give any credence to the frustrations being voiced by those governors, Texas and Arizona? My response has nothing to do with what they think or what they say or what you think about what they say. Uh, our response ha involves two things. Uh, how can we live up to our values and make sure that we have a humane, efficient process uh, to deal with a crisis not of our making? And how can we make sure that the very robust human services that we have built here in the district uh, that are meant to serve DC residents who are an experience in emergency aren't broken by their actions. That's what we're talking about today. Yes. 
Yes, Mayor, you mentioned earlier about the migrants that some are being lied to and even tricked. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I'm, I'm not entirely sure that people um, know that they're coming to D.C. Uh, we also got reports, and we get reports that people are getting off at various places from Texas to D.C. I'm not sure that people um, aren't promised that they're going to get X, Y, and Z when they get off buses. So it, it's just a lot that we don't know um, that's happening uh, at, the, at the southern border um, when people are coming en route is here. Is the state of Texas doing this? I don't know. I don't know. Mayor, uh, Janine with Axios. Yes. Uh, is there any communication with Texas or Arizona? Um, we uh, have attempted uh, communications with all of our counterparts in, I should say, in um, emergency management and in the health and human services. So you reach out to directors, I guess? Correct. But not the governors? Not, nothing from the governors? You, I've, I've answered your question. Yes. Hey, Reza, timeline do you have on, on when you might be able to stand up and be support personnel that would be helping them? We're, we're working uh, expeditiously, Mark, um, and when, as soon as we, um, we know who we'll be working with, we'll announce that. And can we hear from someone from SAMU? Sure. You know what this means for their efforts? Of course. And if you don't mind just identifying yourself, we appreciate that. Hi, uh, thank you. My name is Tatiana Laborde, and I'm the managing director of SAMU First Response. And I want to thank the mayor and then thank Councilmember Nado, who have been extremely uh, helpful since day one. Uh, we're excited to see this new stage, and this is going to really make our response more robust and make sure that the long service, the long-term services that need to be given to this population, will happen. Can I just ask, you know, a lot of the agency, a lot of the nonprofits and NGOs have been critical of Mayor Bowser's request for the National Guard and delay in doing something that she's doing now. What are your thoughts about it taking this long and what's led up to this? We have no official response to that, but we've been working together since day one. And, yes. and, and with that, Diana, Diana, how does this, like moving forward, what does this mean in, for your efforts on the ground? What is that going to look like first? It's going to make it uh, much easier to respond to the 20, 24 hours, seven days a week uh, emergency. Just as an example, we attended a bus yesterday at 1, yesterday at 1030, and the team that's here with us has just finished with the morning bus. Yeah, actually, can I have a follow-up question for Tatiana? Um, I'm wondering, has the number of buses lessened just because buses are now going to Chicago and, and New York's, I, yeah, they're going to more places. I wondered how, like, it's changed now, and yeah. It didn't necessarily lessen because of the other states, but rather because of weather. Okay, so you're seeing less than, but on average, like, weekly, how many folks are you receiving? Uh, weekly, we're receiving probably 10 buses. 10 buses a week. Yes. Um, and then for Mayor Bowser, um, who will be heading the new office? We will make that announcement. We don't, we don't, we haven't made that announcement. Okay. Um, and then if I could ask an off topic question. Uh, let me stay on topic. Okay. Can I ask how long it'll take to set up this office then to get it up and running? Uh, we will, uh, as I mentioned, we're operating in an emergency right now. We'll have, perm we'll have a, we'll present to the council uh, legislation when they get back. And then we will work very quickly to get the services uh, set up. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so um, one question I had, is the city spend money, this money you're talking about, to get the migrants on their way? Uh, the FEMA eligible expenses include transportation. So you're giving them the money and getting reimbursed, or FEMA's giving them the money directly? Um, we will work with all of our partner organizations on how to best facilitate that. But I mean, it's happening now, right? It is. So how is it working? It's working with the partner organizations. Okay, so and the other part here, what's the reaction of DC residents to this? I mean, are you getting complaints or, or what's, what's, what's happening? Um, DC residents want to make sure um, that we are uh, live up to our values 
and that our systems continue to work for them. Are you hearing from them? Or? I do. I do hear from them. I hear from them with points along the spectrum. Uh, I've heard from them around the D.C. National Guard issue uh, where they thought it made uh, perfect sense and they wanted to make sure that the federal government was doing its part in a federal issue. Now, mayors do a lot of things, but we are not responsible for a broken immigration system. What we need in this country is we need the Congress to do its job and fix this immigration system. We have millions of people living in this country who don't have the means um, to take care of themselves and have a secure life. And we need a pathway to citizenship for them. We need a pathway to work for them. And that is not something that mayors can do. Yes. I'm a DC resident and I can tell you that I appreciate these steps. <laughs> it's painful, it's sad what's happening. It is. But you have really stepped up and, and taken on an issue which has been imposed on us. And I applaud you and I applaud your team. And I hope that people here asking the negative questions look at the positive steps that we're taking to help these people who are the most vulnerable. You said it right. It's sad, it's deplorable what's happening, and people, I fear, are fleeing terrible situations, looking for a better life in our country, and our country uh, it really has to have a reasonable system where people can come to our country and live here um, and be able to take care of themselves and their families. Yep. So I understand the practical aspects of the deck. I'm sorry, Antonio Olivo at the Washington Post. I understand the practical aspects of the declaration of public emergency and the adherence to DC values, but you sound very frustrated and it sounds like you're very, you're boxed in by the politics of this. A declaration of emergency is something that the governors of Texas and Arizona want to see uh, for their purposes. Do you feel that frustration? Do you feel boxed in? Um, no, what I feel is, listen, I'm a mayor and I have the first responsibility to make sure that this city operates. Uh, and anybody in my position uh, likes, likes to know what the environment is. Unknowns are bad. And what we're dealing with is a big unknown. Uh, and it's an unknown that's being imposed on us. Uh, and it is an unknown that there are, um, we're gonna do our best to prepare for, to make sure that we have an infrastructure that we didn't have. We, we're not a border town. I think that was your article, right? We're not a border town. And so basically what we're doing today is a new normal for us. We have to have an infrastructure in place that allows us to deal with the border crisis uh, here in Washington, now that has visited us in Washington, D.C. Any other questions? Off topics? Yes. Uh, no, okay, no more questions? Off topics. Amanda had the first. Yeah, so um, I'm wondering the post reported today about uh, the police, uh, the MPD has started enforcing a curfew for juveniles. Um, and so I'm wondering why, and you started this in, in uh, last month, I'm wondering why not make a public announcement like PG County did and warn um, youth and, and their caregivers that they should be inside at a, a reasonable hour um, well, we've always had a curfew. Like, that's not anything new. I don't think, but enforcement hasn't. I mean, you haven't been really, you haven't enforced it. I, think I mean, I think that there have probably been one-off issues of enforcement. There's not a, like, widespread program. But I can promise you if the police encounter a 13-year-old out at 3 o'clock in the morning, they're probably going to get curfew enforced. And I, I, okay, and I wonder why enforce a curfew. I know that some analysis of these curfews have said they're ineffective in reducing crime. Should a 13-year-old be out in the middle of the night? Whether it's a crime or, or he could become a victim of a crime or in, other, in some other unsafe situation? So call it what you want, but if, the, if a 13-year-old is out in the middle of the night, they need an, some adult protection. So I, I answered that question, but Deputy Mayor Gelthard is here. He's going to have um, some more specific information about the incidents um, if the police encounter a, a juvenile who needs to be in custody. Thank you, ma'am. 
Um, and as the mayor said, we have had uh, the Juvenile Curfew Act of 1995 is when it went into, into effect. 2017 was the last time that there was any like major enforcement across the city. And as the mayor said, there are instances where the curfew uh, is enforced at times because exactly what she said, we want to protect our youth. And that's what this is all about. You can go to DC, uh, MPD's website and they have the full pamphlet on there of what the curfew is, what they do to enforce it. But really the bottom line is the police officers will take the person home. And that's what we're doing. So there's no widespread enforcement. There's been no change in our policies on this. Um, when it's necessary to enforce for the protection of our youth, our MPD officers will do that. Oh, can I follow up on that, Deputy Mayor? Because in the past, when you have started ramping up enforcement of this, you've held a press conference. You have given notice to parents and to students. It's usually at the end of summer when you're going out on summer break. And I think it's a legitimate question to, to sure. ask why the city didn't just put out a notice to parents and say, hey, look, be, you know, we're going to start enforcing this again or you know you, you want to be conscious of this or it just seems like it you know you know we're, we all pay pretty close attention in this room right and we're all kind of caught off guard by this so so I'm, I'm not certain mark off. what you're caught off guard by as I said there's been no ramp up of the enforcement of it there's been a steady enforcement of it when necessary Show us those numbers. and there, there's no serious number or uptick in numbers that we've had over this summer than we had over last summer or you know, the curfew is in place. It's an act that's been in since 1995. In we can talk with MPD and get those numbers. Sure. Today? We can get those numbers for you, Mark. Today? We can get the numbers for you. All right. Can you give us, oh, sorry. Can you give us an update on the enforcement of the uh, codes for the marijuana gifting shops? Has there been a delay in this? Uh, we have, we have no comment on it. There hasn't been a delay. I don't know what you mean. Has there been a delay? So that there, so now the, the department in charge of supervising this, they're, they're actually going out and enforcing. Are you talking about ABRA? Yes. Okay, you'll have to, you'll have to ask ABRA if that's a policy, if that is an initiative of theirs. Yep. Here, uh, DC Shadow Rep's home was uh, shot up last night. He tweeted it out. Have you been in contact with him? And what's your response to, to the gun violence that's going on in the district? I'm not familiar with that incident, but I will definitely find out. Yep. Mayor, going back to the, the curfew question, yeah, um, yep. in, the, in the different jurisdiction that you partner with, Prince George's mm -hmm. County, some of the questions were, how would this be enforced? Is it just like if a 13 year old is out, for example, that you mentioned, would they be brought in? Or are police expected to now patrol these areas where young people are known to hang out? Um, if it's a case of patrolling those areas, do you think that that's a viable solution? When police, we know the numbers are strapped in the District of Columbia. Are you asking me about Prince George's County? I'm asking you about whether you think that that's a, a viable means of um, crime prevention in the district and what is happening in the District of Columbia when it comes to this youth curfew. Are there going to be officers now focusing specifically on these places of youth gathering or is it just every now and then if the teen is caught out and not supposed to be out? I would like to ask the chief to respond to you directly about any deployment concerns that he has but to the points that have been raised here we have not announced I have not announced or directed a new initiative around juvenile curfews. I do feel very strongly that juveniles should be in the house, however, um, because we want them to be safe, we don't want them to be unsupervised, and we don't want them to be victims. Do you, just a follow-up though, I mean, do you think that it's effective that police in the, the District of Columbia should be actively patrolling those places where abuse are known? Yeah. They are actively patrolling those areas. But They're actively patrolling them right now. But to in specifically to enforce the curfew. Listen, they enforce part part. Some of the biggest problems we have with juveniles is not being at school when they're supposed to be at school. So when you ask me, are police enforcing where juveniles are? They are enforcing truancy right now. They're going to places where juveniles hang out when they should be at school. Uh, we had a very unfortunate incident uh, during the first week of school where young people were hanging out somewhere instead of being at school. So we want young people to be where they're supposed to be with trusted adults. School during school hours, after school activities with adults, um, but after 11 o'clock they should be at home. 
um, or they should be with a trusted adult or they should be uh, someplace where their parents feel comfortable with. So that's, you know, that if I'm not sure if that is your question, but police are enforcing um, a, a lot of issues involving juveniles and not just after 11 o'clock at night um, because we have issues with truancy that are problematic as well. And we want young people not to be hanging out with each other before school um, when they should be in class. Thank you. Yeah, okay, a couple more questions in this last one. And yes, sir. Has there been any update on the standoff over RFK Stadium with Bill Mendelssohn? Has, has anything changed between you two? I, I'm trying to remember what we last reported to you, but uh, our our issue was not with Phil Mendelson. Only the count, Congresswoman can introduce legislation at the Congress. I think there's a disagreement between the council not wanting the stadium. They want to put a restriction on. I do not support uh, telling the Congress to restrict our autonomy, and I won't. Right, but how is this process going to move along? That's up to the Congresswoman. The Congresswoman can introduce the bill that's best for DC residents, uh, and we hope that it proceeds. You know why she hasn't done that yet? You would have to ask her. Any questions? Any last question? Gary Sarka, ABC News. Yep. Uh, Mayor, the numbers show that the performance at ABC uh, improved under interim director Cleo Sabido, but you posted her and brought back Kareem Mahomes, uh, the person at the center of the screen. <coughs> Um, we understand that another board is, is about to be released uh, in the wake of multiple deaths. And my question is, how can you leave her in charge? And frankly, how many people have to die before they're on charge? Um, I'm not really sure what report you are referring to, um, but I do know that Karima Holmes brings a level of experience that's unparalleled. Uh, in, in my experience in D.C. government, which goes back 15 years, in understanding all aspects of the job. Uh, and I'm also not sure what you're re referring to in terms of a, a different set of performance metrics, but I'm happy uh, to look at those. Also, Mayor, obviously there's no more important role in the government to protect its citizens. My question is, if, if it can't be fixed through your office, how can that problem ever get fixed? What are you talking about? What, what can't get fixed? At, uh, at the OUC. Well, let me explain something to you about 911 calls. And what did you say your name was? Uh, Gary Serka, ABC 7. Okay, Gary. The, the OUC gets thousands upon thousands upon thousands of calls. Um, all with people um, calling in various stages of, of distress. Uh, now, if you want to pick out or cherry pick one or two calls, you I'll can do that. that. But thousands of calls uh, where police and fire and EMS are dispatched to DC residents in, in times of, of distress. And so that's what we're focused on. And we are also focused on learning from all calls. Um, if there are things that need to be changed or things that need to be done better, uh, we learn from all of our calls. But what we won't do um, is really focus on information that's being cherry picked by one or two people uh, when we have a vast um, exam we have vast examples of the, the type of work, stressful work that they do every day. Are there more Thank mistakes you. being made now than there were? I have no idea what you're referring to. Uh, mistakes that are made in dispatch. I'm sorry? Mistakes that are made during dispatch that result possibly in uh, what, uh, what I know um, is that some people who are reporting on OUC are more interested in talking about mistakes in Karima Holmes than they are in talking about um, possible mistakes in other people. I don't really know what that's about, but I do, I do recognize that that is happening. What I also know uh, is that with the thousands of calls that they received, if there are any opportunities to change processes or management or um, looking at how calls are dispatched, we take those very seriously. Okay, Stephanie, you have the very last question. 
Um, no, I, I did want to ask if there's a response to the, the mental health standoff uh, and an update to that as well that we saw yesterday with the man who was naked and then climbing. I don't have anything on that right now. Can we? Yeah, you can talk to him after. Last question. Not a question, but I just maybe a response to the gentleman. My, my home, I live in the World War, made a call for 911 because my granddaughter was basically dead. 911 responded in seconds. That case, from my side, I have to say, 911, District of Columbia, thank you so much. Thank you, Marie. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you.